Welcome, you're watching A Closer Look Mitochondrial Disease. I'm your host, Tony Kayumi. Today's program will feature three separate video segments, each of which will be followed by a panel discussion with different guests. The first video segment that you'll be viewing is titled Mitochondrial Disease. Mitochondria are organelles in the cytoplasm of cells. They exist in nearly every cell of our bodies, and they produce 90% of the energy our bodies need to function. Every year, 1,000 to 4,000 American children are born with a mitochondrial disease. Exact numbers of children and adults who are suffering from the disease are hard to determine because it is often misdiagnosed. However, experts say the frequency of mitochondrial disease in the United States is approaching that of childhood cancers. No allergies. For many individuals with mitochondrial disease, it is an inherited genetic condition. While for other people, their mitochondria are affected by environmental factors. Dr. Bruce Cohen is the director of neurology at Akron Children's Hospital and is a specialist in mitochondrial disease. Well, there's about 1,100 different parts to the mitochondria. Each part of the mitochondria is made out of a gene, and these genes are scattered uh, through our genetic material. There's about 22,000 genes in the human body, and about 1,100 of these genes are there to make our mitochondria. If these genes are all perfect, our mitochondria should assemble and function perfectly well. But if there's a mutation in any one of those genes, that mutation can be so severe that it creates one of the proteins not to function properly. And even if just one protein doesn't function properly, the whole mitochondria may not function properly. When mitochondria don't work, they don't make it as much energy as they would otherwise, and then organs can fail. And that could be heart failure, brain failure, muscle failure, and most commonly combinations of the major organ systems uh, begin to fail. Mitochondrial disease can vary vastly between different people. It can strike the young or old. Symptoms can be mild or severe and progress rapidly or slowly. There are treatments that may alleviate some symptoms, but there is currently no cure for mitochondrial disease, no definitive symptoms, and no single screening test that can be used to diagnose it. However, if a child or adult has more than three organ systems with problems, or if a typical disease exhibits atypical qualities, those could be red flags for mitochondrial disease. Palliative care is absolutely critical in the management of children with mitochondrial disease. And that doesn't mean we give up. So we diagnose some children with mitochondrial disease where we know that pending a miracle, the ultimate nature of the disease will be deterioration and subsequently death. And I think it makes perfect sense to involve palliative care very early on in the process. Really, as soon as the parents come to grips with the fact that this is a life-threatening illness, we really do need to uh, get the services of palliative care to really have the best interests of the child and family in mind. Dr. Sarah Freebert is the Director of Pediatric Palliative Care at Akron Children's Hospital. It is a team effort. It's done by an interdisciplinary team of professionals who really get to know the child and family, find out what the hopes, the goals, the wishes, the needs are, and then try to work with the family as care changes, as the path changes, to continue to advocate for the child's best interest, to help families navigate a fragmented healthcare system, to make sure that the child is free from physical suffering, and to really help the family figure out how to remain a whole family and take care of each other, other children, hold down jobs, be productive members of society, stay married or in whatever relationship they're in, remain sane, if you will, uh, and continue to function, no matter what that child's prognosis is. There are many people who have a mitochondrial disease and don't even know it. And not everyone who has the disease dies from it. As researchers continue to search for a cure, both experts and families affected by the disease agree. Other physicians and the American public need to become better educated about mitochondrial disease.
Our guests for the mitochondrial disease panel discussion are Dr. Bruce Cohen, Dr. Cassandra Hirsch, and Dr. Sarah Freebert. They are all with Akron Children's Hospital, which was our nonprofit co production partner for the videos. They provided us with content matter expertise on palliative care and mitochondrial disease. I want to start off by saying thank you so much for allowing us to have this collaboration so that we can educate the public about these important health care issues. Thank you. Dr. Cohen, can you start us out by telling us again why it is so difficult to diagnose mitochondrial disease? Well, there's really several hundred known mitochondrial diseases and potentially over a thousand different causes of mitochondrial diseases. So they're not all exactly alike. They can differ in severity and age of onset. We have children with mitochondrial diseases that get sick in their first few months of life and succumb to the disease really a few months after that. And other people that go through childhood perfectly fine and then get sick as adults. In addition, some of the diseases that present in childhood, uh, although they can be, some can be severe, some can be uh, quite innocuous initially and uh, the children may not appear that ill uh, but have symptoms and be very difficult to diagnose because the symptoms are mild on the spectrum of uh, what we would see in, in otherwise uh, different childhood illnesses. Now sometimes it's misdiagnosed and said to be a psychological problem versus a physical problem. Could you elaborate on that? Absolutely. We have plenty of patients that come to us um, having been labeled by their physicians as having Johnny's disease or a psychosomatic illness uh, is another not uncommon uh, uh, presentation. So th this, this is because the symptoms sometimes are, uh, are, are, are mild, um, tend to come and go, may not be present all the time, and uh, therefore lend itself to um, that's, that era of psychiatric illness. Now, Dr. Hirsch, palliative care can provide so many different things for the patients and their families, ranging from pain management to symptom management, as well as emotional support. Could you elaborate on how that team environment helps both the families and the patient? Some of these patients have anxiety, which we can help manage. Um, sometimes they have issues with sleep, sometimes with um, managing secretions. There are many things that we can manage medi medically with medications. Um, additionally, you know, with the anxiety piece, with the emotional distress of having this diagnosis or trying to find um, a diagnosis if they're in the process of being diagnosed, um, we have a support staff on our team that can help them. We have chaplaincy, we have psychology, um, the physicians. We, we have a large staff that can help address the needs that come up for these patients. Can you also elaborate on what can be done with the families? We work closely with not only the patients but their parents and their siblings. If the siblings are having difficulty, you know, adjusting to their sibling being sick all the time, we have child life specialists to work with them. With the parents, sometimes it's coping with, you know, who do I, who do I see next or what do I do with this symptom? You know, they can always call us as a support and a resource to direct them and guide them as well as to listen to the distress they might be having over their child's illness and what that means for their child. Now, sometimes I know that it's not just the family life and it's not just their interactions with the healthcare teams, but also the fact that they have lives outside of the home, outside of the hospital. They have lives, whether it's in their schools, their church, their community, their workplaces. Can you explain how palliative care can also be of assistance in helping other people who are in their lives to understand what's going on with the patient and the families? Our goal is always to have the child be in their normal life as much as they can and help them do through that process. So sometimes if it's working with the school, it's meeting with the teacher to help have accommodations made if that's something that they need. It could be having someone from our team go out and explain to the other students maybe why something is different for this child, why they might not eat lunch like the other kids do in the cafeteria. We really will do anything that we can to help make it so these kids can pursue their normal lives as much as humanly possible. Now, I know that it's a difficult uh, health care system sometimes to navigate when you have multiple organ issues, a lot of different specialists, and just the complexity of that. Uh, Dr. Freeper, could you explain how palliative care can also help with that aspect? Our health care system right now is not really designed ideally for children and families who are dealing with something that's so complex and chronic. We have a lot of pieces in place to help with various symptoms or organ dysfunction, but what's sometimes missing for these families, and you'll hear dramatically described in the upcoming segment, is that they bounce from entry point to entry point in the health care system. They bounce among different specialists, and while those folks are well-intentioned and, and really do try to help families, 
what, what is missing is that element of really treating the child and family as a whole person and a whole unit and putting all of those pieces together as part of a whole puzzle. So what palliative care can do is to offer that really centralization, that one-stop shopping, that captain of the ship, if you will, to keep everything in mind so that what one person is doing or saying is not in conflict with another. The, the reason that that's helpful, among other things, is that it does, it takes the pressure off of the family to be their child's full-time case manager or care coordinator and to carry the burden of worrying about conflicting medical information or conflicting appointments. So we really do try to tie things together for families. And also from what I understand, health care insurance and dealing with all of that aspects can be incredibly difficult. How can you help with guidance in that issue? You're, you're absolutely right, Tony. It's, it's a difficult system, even when you don't have something significant going on. And when you add to that the burden of a child who's ill, dealing with forms that need to be filled out, things that are changing, things that need to be prior authorized, for instance, medications or supplies that children need, we often have to jump through several hoops to get those things ordered for children. So our team really works to try to take some of that work away from families, to help them get through the process as seamlessly as possible and, and have quick and ready access to the medical medicines they need, the therapies they need, the equipment they need, um, and really not to have to worry about burdens and paperwork and details. They, they have enough to deal with and enough on their plate. And that's our social workers and our case management staff and others in our office that really can often find the shortcuts and the easier ways to get things done. One of the parents that we spoke to made mention to the fact that you were the first person to ask her how she was doing how much sleep was she getting, how was she handling the situation. Can we talk a little bit about uh, the fact that being a full-time caregiver is exhausting and, and how sometimes so people are afraid to ask for help. They want to keep doing it themselves as long as they possibly can. Why it's a good thing as early as possible to ask for assistance. That is a huge issue, and I think you're, you hit it on the head when you said people are afraid to ask for help, and they often get into, parents especially get into fight mode where they're, they're used to having to fight for things that their children and families need, um, and it's difficult for them sometimes to let go and to trust that somebody's actually going to pick up the ball. So I think one of the things that's been most gratifying in our work with families is to build that relationship and that rapport so that they know that we will do what we say we're going to do and that they can hand off some of the responsibilities and allow them, the family, to focus on their other children, their own relationships, and the child who's ill in front of them instead of having to deal with all of those extraneous things. But you're right, it takes a huge toll on anyone to have a chronic illness in a family. In the video that we watched, we saw a wide range of ages and severity of mitochondrial disease. Could you talk a little bit about the fact that mitochondrial disease is not always terminal and the fact that it really does affect people in so many different ways? That's a great question. As best we understand, about 10% of the mitochondrial diseases lead to death within childhood, within the first 15 years of life or so. 90% of these disorders uh, are not ultimately fatal or shorten life expectancy that much. Uh, the person carries with them the burden of the illness throughout life. They may be left quite disabled uh, early on, or they may be walking um, into their 60s, yet walking with symptoms of a mitochondrial disease. Uh, that's one of the mysteries of mitochondrial disease and one of the challenges in terms of, of dealing with it. I want to also highlight the fact that there are a lot of people who have misunderstandings about palliative care. They're, in a sense, uh, putting it on the same path as hospice care, and it's two totally different things, and that you can use palliative care even if you're not diagnosed as a terminal case. Can we elaborate on palliative care as an assistance in people's lives, even if it's not a terminal disease? So palliative care really is appropriate for any child with any complex chronic illness, and so it doesn't have to be a terminal illness. And just because they're getting palliative care involved does not mean, as you said, they're getting hospice. Um, but we're there to be a support and to help with care coordination and help them walk through the process regardless of how the journey turns out, even if they're walking into their 60s.
Hospice is a really important part of the care continuum for those patients that are very severely affected or who are going to have a terminal outcome. And we partner with them a lot for those families. But for the great majority, as Dr. Cohen said, we're talking about an altered life, but still a, a normal timed life. And so our job in palliative care is really to find out what allows that family to live the best life they can for their for themselves and their children and augment those supports to allow them to do that. And that can be months, years, decades. How is pediatric palliative care different than palliative care for adults? Adult palliative care really does focus more on a terminal condition that at some point will end that adult's life prematurely. So in many ways, um, adult palliative care is, is kind of the step right before hospice care for adults. And in pediatric palliative care, we focus really on Again, meeting families very early in the journey of a diagnosis of something that will be complex, chronic, and potentially life-shortening. But we actually spend a lot of time working with families over their child's lifetime, which is somewhat different. There are also many differences between children and adults in terms of the diseases they get, the effects that it has on them, their systems, and their lives that make some of the nuances of the care. But I would, I would say that the basic difference is really the length of time that our team is involved with the families that we work with. We have about a minute left in the, this segment. Anything important that you wanted to add? Well, I think the concept of palliative care is critical. As, as a neurologist or as a mitochondrial doctor, I'm trained to provide, trained and, and skilled at providing certain types of, of care, but I'm not the medical home for most of these children. Palli the palliative care services really do provide that, um, as, as Dr. Freebert said, one-stop shopping for the integrated care of these children. Again, I want to thank all of you for joining us for this segment of the panel discussion, and thank you for the partnership. We really appreciate it. The next segment that we're about to view is titled Caroline's Story. Jennifer and Marty Lyman live in Northeast Ohio. Their daughter Caroline had mitochondrial disease. Caroline was born um, on May 10th, 1997. And then it was about, when she was about three months old, is when she started to exhibit some kind of symptoms. But at that point, we did not know it was mitochondrial disease. Um, you know, we just thought, honestly, she, we thought she was beginning to be colicky and that, um, you know, she was having some kind of allergies to the formula because she started getting kind of crabby. Um, she was really fussy. She wasn't sleeping well. We took her into our pediatrician and um, we tried all kinds of things that any, you know, pediatrician would tell a first time um, mom and dad. So then um, it was like the end of August when then all of a sudden I noticed that she was no longer able to track, uh, track me as I was like walking across the room and she was no longer smiling. And it just seemed like there was something going on where she just wasn't there anymore. Like she just seemed really distant. Caroline started having seizures and difficulty digesting food. She also developed an immune system disorder and began having frequent infections. If someone says, oh, well, what did Caroline have? And then I say, well, she had a mitochondrial disorder. And they say, oh, my goodness, what is that? I've never heard of that. And that's generally what we hear. And I just explain it in a very um, simple form, you know, that the mitochondria is the power plant of the cell, and it provides the necessary energy to um, the organs and systems in the body. And with lack of healthy functioning mitochondria, then all those systems are compromised and causing muscle weakness and immune disorders. Um, so I kind of break it down like that. And I also tell people, you know, because people say, oh, well, it must be genetic. I mean, that was a big thing for us. So many people, oh, it must be genetic. It can be genetic. Um, but often at times it's not genetic, and often at times it's a random fluke situation. In our case, that's what it was. We went through as much genetic testing is there was made available and everything was inconclusive. Um, so there was always that worry when I was pregnant with Abby. I didn't worry. Everyone else around me worried. Everyone worried. On October 31st, 2001, when Caroline was four, her sister Abby was born. Abby has never exhibited any signs of mitochondrial disease. Well, I was young and I didn't really understand yet how hard it must have been for her. So I feel like I never did, I always knew her and was very close to her, but I feel like 
now she was still here, I would do so much more with her because I don't think I realized enough that she, that how serious it was. But even though that, my relationship was very close with her. Um, from a personality perspective, um, you had you know to work a little to understand Caroline. She was nonverbal, but if you rubbed her nose, you know she would wheel around a little. Her eyes would get big when she recognized voices, and these were the little subtle cues that we would get to know because we were with her all the time. She loved the wind. Um, whenever the wind blew, she would you know open her mouth and kind of move her head a little. And so those were the little things that she really took pleasure in. And so. Um, you know, once more, the lesson being the little things. Um, she appreciated them, and you learned to, you know, enjoy those those moments, those little subtle things. It wasn't until Caroline was eight years old that the Lyman family met Dr. Sarah Freebert. From that point on, Dr. Freebert and the rest of the pediatric palliative care team at Akron Children's Hospital played a major role in helping the Lymans to live as normal a lifestyle as possible people confuse palliative care with hospice and assume when they hear the words your child would benefit from palliative care that that means that the care team is giving up on the child that all hope is lost so we really have a lot of work to do to help folks understand that palliative care is essentially anticipatory guidance holistic care for children and families facing a life-threatening condition independent of the child's prognosis we have many children in our program who have actually survived, thrived, gone on, done well, and even graduated from palliative care. Nothing makes us happier than a graduation from palliative care. But that doesn't stop the need that occurs at diagnosis. So what we've really tried to do is to get people's awareness to a point where they recognize that hospice, as valuable and important as it is, has a role in a child's care, in a patient's care, at a defined period during that illness trajectory. Palliative care starts earlier. We really prefer to be brought into the care of a child at diagnosis of a life-threatening condition. And we are there regardless of what the trajectory looks like. Many children stabilize for a long time. We have children in our palliative care program who have been there since I opened the doors of the program 12 years ago. And they're doing well in their communities. It is not about death and dying. It is not about giving up hope. It is about finding hope and finding joy and finding quality in life while dealing with a disease or an illness, while receiving cure-directed therapy, while going on with your life as normal. Caroline's disease was a multi-system disorder, so we had a variety of specialists from epilepsy doctors, um, GI, immune deficiency, etc. And the palliative care group was the first group that kind of took an approach of let's look at all of those together and find a way to coordinate the care. So um, less of the conflicts where we were left as uh, lay people into the medical profession trying to figure that out. Um, the palliative care group brought their medical expertise in to tie all of those together, which was invaluable experience. Uh, number two, they were very um, focused on trying to keep us at home as much as possible which was, um, we feel better, and I think generally accepted uh, in the medical community better for the patient. More comfortable, more family time, um, you know, less risk of infection in the hospital, et cetera. Abby became especially attached to the pediatric palliative care team. Well, they were, became family for me, and especially I would hang out with them like friends. I'm, when Caroline was in the hospital, I'd stay in there for hours just playing with all the toys. So not did it just become somewhere I was used to, but a home. Then on June 7, 2009, Caroline's health took a turn for the worse. As much as we spent the time in the hospital, we just didn't want her, her last breath to be there. So we brought her home. And of course, palliative care was with us. And then Abby came home from my sister's house. And, uh, you know, we had... We always had hospice on board, not just palliative care. We had hospice, our home health nurses. And um, they came and, um, you know, just, you know, took the breathing tube out of Caroline. And she passed away quickly and very slowly. It was very peaceful. But it was a beautiful day. And, uh, you know, she was in her room. And you know, there's lots of birds chirping. And uh, 
she was pretty. Caroline Lyman died from mitochondrial disease when she was 12 years old. More than five years have passed since then, yet the Lyman family and Akron Children's Hospital's pediatric palliative care team continue to have a close relationship. Since Caroline has died, we have remained entrenched with the Lyman family. We still see them, we still speak with them. If they need someone to talk to, if they're grieving, if they have questions about Abby's coping or her changing developmental understanding of what happened to her sister, we're there. We remain available to them 24-7 and we have been supportive of their various community activities around raising awareness for mitochondrial disorder. And in fact, Caroline lives on through the making of this film that Marty and Jennifer helped finance because they felt it was important to get this word out to the community. Our guests for the follow-up discussion to Caroline's story are her family. To my left, we have Jennifer Lyman, and then Abby Lyman, and Marty Lyman. Thank, Thank you. you. Marty, could you start us out by telling us what motivated you to open up your hearts and home to the production crew to allow us into your home and, and to hear your personal story about Caroline? Uh, the, the two organizations that we're supporting with this effort are the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation and the Akron Children's Medical Center's Palliative Care Department, and they're both organizations that we feel strongly about the positive impact they can make in folks' lives, and, and it allowed us to have an opportunity to share our stories so some people can hopefully get some benefit from that, and it made it easy to do, and then we have always enjoyed talking about Caroline Idara that passed away, and, and, and you know, we contributed to this cause because it's one of the ways that she can make a positive impact in her life, you know, uh, you know beyond her death, and uh, it makes us feel good to talk about her. It's not a topic that we're uncomfortable talking with, and it feels good. Now, Abby, you grew up with the pediatric palliative care team as part of your family in a way. Could you elaborate about what that was like? Well, you know, I was just a kid, so, you know, I was very open to, and I was a kid, my mom will tell you, I was not shy. I was very open to new people coming into my life, but, you know, these people aren't just people. They have came up to me. I've never, even after when I grew up and understood what it was like to open up to people, I never closed back up because these people are wonderful. And that video showed, like, you know, maybe this is not the most common disease you've ever heard of, but it impacts just as many people. And, you know, if if your child has mitochondrial disease, it shows that that's the best place to go because it's family, but, and they also understand how it feels, and they never make it be about the disease, they make it be about the child and their life. So. Now for you, what different things did the palliative care team do for you personally as a sibling of an ill child? Well, like, she spent so much time in the hospital, and I, I honestly grew to love the hospital because it's just a fun hospital um, with all the gift shops and all that um, and you know the palliative care room one of them is very homey and there's lots of toys there so when they be Caroline would be in, during doctors appointments and things like that and my mom and dad would be up there they would have me go down there and I would be um, in there for a few hours and playing and you know I never get bored and they were they just do everything to give me ha um, give me something to do when my sister was getting treated and you know it just worked out that way they were like they weren't babysitters they were way more than that they were like having another mom and dad with me all the time so as you've gotten older and time has passed how do you look at mitochondrial disease differently and what your family experienced and what are your personal goals for the future well, you know, this is this is an interesting story, though, because, like, Caroline, I was young, and I didn't understand what it was like to lose someone, and it was obviously very hard. Now, it's something, you know, that was so sad, you know, I can't, I can't remember it that well, because I was only seven, 
but my dog, who I'm very close to, who reminded me of Caroline a lot, just in ways, um, she passed away when she was almost two, and that's when I had matured more, and I went through the grieving process more fre um, frequently, and I knew if Caroline would have been alive at that time, and I learned about what grief is like, and so having Elfie showed me um, that, you know, what Caroline um, went through and our family went through. And so grief is a hard thing to handle, but, you know, palliative care, of course, helps get you get through it. They help you. They don't stop. If the child passes away, they stay with you for the rest of your lives. Um, my goals are, well, I just want people to understand, you know, one of my things that have always bugged me when people call me an only child, I'm like, I am not an only child. When your grandma dies, do you have a grandma still that's up in heaven? Yes, you do. So when kids call me an only child or when they say, you're an only child, right? I'm like, no, I had the most amazing sister on this planet or in heaven. So the, my goal is just to make sure people understand that, you know, she's just as much as a sister to me as your sister on earth may be right now. Jennifer, can you share with us uh, palliative <clears throat> care and the role they played with your family? Um, <clears throat> well, I often kind of say to myself, you know, now that I've had, it's, well, it's been five years since Caroline has, has gone to heaven and, um, you know, the, the nature of me and my personality is, you know, could I have done anything differently? You know, was there something I missed? Um, but I've really come to some kind of closure that, you know, there isn't anything else I could have done, really, for Caroline. Um, I guess the only thing, if I ever had to do it all over again, is knowing palliative care earlier on than we did. You know, I wished we could have worked with them from the moment she was diagnosed from 18 months of age because, you know, as a mom, there's things that happen, that you have like these aha <coughs> moments, you know, something that was really pivotal and um, or instrumental as far as the care of working with a chronically ill child and palliative care certainly met those needs. Um, you know, instead of transporting her back and forth to a million doctors and waiting rooms and places where she could catch more, you know, germs and bugs than she already had. Um, you know, it, w it was exhausting. It was really exhausting having all of that. And thus, you know, working with palliative care gave us the opportunity to downsize Caroline so that it wasn't just all these doctor's appointments. It was like a one-stop shop for all of her care. And, um, and then after, you know, Caroline passed, it was continuing to communicate with them and stay in touch and they know what things that Abby is doing and the whole grieving process and I mean it, it was just monumental in our lives. I was kind of described it a little as it, it improved the overall quality of life because you had a lot of, you know, with mitochondrial disease and in Caroline's specific case it was a multi-system disorder so she had different specialists, different types of doctors and coordinating that care, there's, you know, that's something most of us don't have much experience in doing. And so one of the functions that palliative care really provided for us is kind of quarterbacked all those efforts um, and coordinated care and just allowed us to spend more time at home, um, better treatments, better quality of life for Caroline, most importantly, uh, but for all of us to spend more and better quality time um, at home, which is one of the reasons we enjoy you know, and, and believe in the program so much. Can you share with us a little bit about continuing on the legacy? You briefly touched upon that for Caroline, whether that's with your foundation or spreading the word about mitochondrial disease through this video and your other efforts, just sharing how you're keeping her memory alive. Sure. I, probably the concise way to start is I always say that, that Caroline, um, without ever speaking a word, taught me some of the most valuable lessons I have in my life, and including appreciate every day because tomorrow's not promised to any of us. And uh, the struggles and the effort that she made just to live life, what would be, um, might be a disappointment for us, a bad day at work is a complete victory and success for her. So it really helped shape my attitude, and I think all of our attitude to the positive. Uh, you know, and we established the Caroline Lyman and Family Foundation for the purpose of perpetuating some of the things that she taught us. I mentioned earlier with uh, the Paddock Care Group, but also the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation, 
um, with the research that's going on with their disease that when we started out was, you know, 10th grade biology, if we, any of us were lucky, we remembered that couple minutes about it. And in the span of, you know, it's about 15 years that we've been involved with that organization now, we've seen an incredible amount of progress as far as diagnosis, starting some limited critical, clinical trials, um, some efforts um, on Capitol Hill to get le you know, legislation that will fund research. Um, so it's been very rewarding in that regard. And, and those are all things that if we can do that and Caroline's name's on it, um, it makes us feel good. And from a, you know, Abby's talked a lot about her sister, but it's one of the ways that we can honor her and, you know, someday see Abby continuing that and passing, it'll get a way to tell her about her aunt, you know, someday. Um, and, and Caroline can live on that way. I want to thank you so much again for opening up your home to us and sharing your story with us. Thank you. You're welcome. The next video segment that you'll be seeing is called Karina's Story. Christy and Sean Strasser live in Southwest Ohio. Their daughter Karina was born on April 28, 1997. Karina experienced some bowel issues when she was young, but she had an active and happy childhood. It wasn't until Karina turned 12 that major health complications began to arise. She was later diagnosed with mitochondrial disease. This is a genetic disease. It was put in my DNA from day one. I might have thought I was going to have a different life, but I was never going to have a different life. This was the life that was planned for me from day one. And that is what keeps me sane a lot of times is knowing that, that nothing was really taken away from me. I just didn't know it. I just didn't know it yet, what my life was going to be like. It didn't look like mitochondrial disease until like a year or even like a year and a half into tests and um, feeding tubes and surgeries and everything because it for a year and a half it was like just in my colon and then it like moved up to my small bowel and then to my stomach and then I went into complete intestinal failure and then my whole body started going. The Strasser family became involved with Dr. Sarah Freebert and the pediatric palliative care team at Akron Children's Hospital when Karina was 15. The palliative care is so important because, um, I mean, it's just, it's quality of life care. I mean, everybody deserves quality of life. And no matter what. I re remember the first time I ever met Dr. Sarah Freebert and um, how she, it, I was so impressed that she, she told me things about mitochondrial disease that I didn't know and usually it was me going in and educating a doctor about that and it was like I think it, it was somewhat of a relief because I had became the one person that was man not only taking care of her, but managing everybody, all the physicians, all the specialists. Um, and it was becoming exhausting. And when people wouldn't listen to me, I would get upset. And it was the first time that I felt like I wasn't alone in caring for her. It, somebody else cared about her as a person and her whole body, not just what specific organ they were managing at that time or placing blame on the other specialist's organ. Um, and it was just comforting to know that, you know, somebody was on the case that knew about the disease and knew um, and cared about our whole family and about um, Karina. As you know, this disease robs people of a lot of what it takes to feel like a person. For Karina, she was a dancer. She wanted to be a makeup artist. She had a huge bucket list of things that she wanted to accomplish. She was a busy girl. And gradually, as she went through her illness, she was robbed one by one of all the things that made her feel as if she were a whole person. So I think what a large part of what we offered was listening and allowing them to talk 
both confidentially and individually with us and then also together as a family so that Christy and Sean could honor what Karina wanted in her life and at the end of her life while also acknowledging and struggling through the tremendous loss they were experiencing as their only child began to lose her life in front of their eyes. I'm scared of going on without her. Sorry. I'm not scared at all about taking care of her and making her life good. I'm good at that. Um, and I'm okay as long as she's here, but I'm scared of how I'm gonna go on without her. But I try hard not to show her that because I don't want her to worry about me. Um, but when that happens, my world will crumble. <laughs> But I know that they'll know that I didn't lose my battle with Mido. I won because I'm going to a better place, being free and where I was, I'm where I'm supposed to be, going home. If I just lay here, would you lie with me? And just forget the world On December 11th, 2013, less than a month after she spoke those words, Karina Strasser died from mitochondrial disease. She was 16 years old. Dr. Freebert and the pediatric palliative care team remain in touch with Christy and Sean. If Christy is lonely or grieving or sad and need someone to talk to, particularly someone not in her own house or her own community, then we're there. And we continue to offer grief and bereavement services in conjunction with the hospice agency that serves the family. So we never go away. We're there as long as families need us to be there. And for some families, that's very intense for a short period of time. And for some families, we know them longer after their child has died than we did before. Karina wanted her life and her death to have meaning. Karina hoped that by sharing her story, she would help to educate people about mitochondrial disease. The statistics are that it kills more children than all pedi pediatric cancers combined. But nobody knows about it. Like, I want mitochondrial disease to be something that is said in every household because the only way for there to be a cure is for awareness because that's the only way they get research money and that is so important to me even though it might be too late to help me that if I if other kids can't won't suffer because of something I did, then that makes my life and my pain worth it. On June 17, 2014, Governor John Kasich signed Senate Bill 300. It officially made September Mitochondrial Disease Awareness Month in the state of Ohio. The bill is known as the Karina Strasser Act. Karina believed that spreading the word about mitochondrial disease would help researchers to eventually defeat it. In honor of Karina and all of the individuals and families impacted by mitochondrial disease, please share what you've learned from this video with the people in your life. Our guests for the panel discussion following Karina's story are her parents, Christy Strasser and Sean Strasser. Thank you for joining us here today. Thank you for having us. I was hoping you might be able to start us off a little bit by talking about the video portion that we just watched. One of the things that Karina told us was that she was hoping that she could help spread the word and educate the public about mitochondrial disease. What do you think her feelings would be about this video? Um, I think she would just think it's amazing, and she used that word a lot. Um, when she, there was something that was just kind of beyond words, um, she would use amazing. Um, I think she would 
feel like it's completely living out um, what she wanted people to know and what she wanted people to take from her story um, and part of why she was so public with her story. One of the things that has been accomplished since she's passed away was the legislation. Can you tell us a little bit about how all of that came into fruition? Um, we actually, it's, it's kind of funny, we, we, there was a message on our answering machine and we almost deleted it because it was a politician <laughs> and um, we thought it was, you know, just a typical kind of recording and um, it was uh, Senator Beagle who um, had been together with uh, Representative Beakey and um, uh, Senator Faber and they had came up with this idea that they wanted to start the legislative process and wanted our blessing. And of course we said yes, um, and that they wanted to honor Karina and call it the Karina Strasser Act. Um, I think that spoke volumes that, first of all, they knew what mitochondrial disease was to legislate for it. Um, that told me that Karina had done her job and that they felt strongly as we did to take that to the state level. I say all the time um, we're powerful. We're a powerful family because um, we're on a mission, but sometimes you can only get it so far. And so they really um, took that initiative for us. That piece of legislation and the impact that's going to make on the future spreading the word about mitochondrial disease by saying that September is Mitochondrial Disease Awareness Month in the state of Ohio. What long-range goals do you have for that legislation and to keep Karina's legacy alive? I think, um, of course, first of all is raising awareness. Um, and Karina said in, in her video that people support what they know. And um, I think that's number one. Um, of course... The goal is to, um, you know, raise awareness, and with that, um, unfortunately, you need money sometimes to get where you need to go, and um, so in that, um, you know, we're, uh, hopefully it will raise some funds um, for research for mitochondrial disease and um, continue hopefully taking us to the next level of what we need with this disease um, with research, diagnosis, um, treatment. Can you talk about some of the challenges that families affected by mitochondrial disease face? Because people aren't that aware of the disease. It's difficult to diagnose, difficult to treat, and right now there's no cure. Can you elaborate just about how that impacts you differently than, say, cancer or other serious illnesses that affect children? Um, I think for me, it's we went to four different hospitals before we finally had someone tell us what they thought was going on. At every hospital, they'd be like, they would do things, then all of a sudden, they're like, we can't do anything else because we don't know what's wrong. You need to go here. Then we go to the next stop and the next stop until finally we was able to get some answers and know what direction to go. And it was us advocating. Right. Um, and unfortunately, um, you know, I look back, ironically, there were so many times that, you know, well, she needs to be leading a normal life. And, you know, she couldn't do that. You know, she was so uncomfortable and so um, having so many symptoms. And they would say that, but they didn't know what to do to follow up with that um, to make it happen that she was comfortable to live a life. And, um, you know, that's kind of where palliative care came in. Um, but also, you know, we, what makes it different, um, nobody sat down with us and said, this is how we're going to save your child. Um, that discussion never happened because there wasn't any way to save her. Um, and as a parent, <laughs> That's huge. You know, you wish somebody had came to you and said, um, even gave you some odds. You know, there, were, there weren't any. It was just how they could treat her symptoms. So, Can you elaborate a little bit about the role that palliative care played 
earlier on in the illness as well as in the final days. They told us what to expect and no one else did that. They told us things that no one else told us. They told us to let her live her life. And that's what we did at that point. It, it's ironic that you know, so many people are often afraid of hearing those words, whether, you know, when it comes to palliative care. And, you know, for us, even down the line as we were in hospice, um, the focus from palliative care was always about how can we get her to do what she wants to do. Um, and also, you know, they were the first ones that cared about our whole family and um, asked me if I was sleeping at night, <laughs> you know, which I didn't care, but um, nobody ever asked that. They just added treatments and never, you know, bothered how I was doing that. Um, and so I think, and comfort. I, I mean, she truly was able to enjoy some things because she was comfortable. One of the things that I found really impressive about your story was when I heard about all the things that the people in the community of Greenville did for your family. And we didn't have time, of course, to cover that in the video portion, but if you'd like to share about how they really rallied around you, I think that that's just such an amazing contribution that, that people offered. The biggest thing for me is the room they built her. You guys were there, you mm -hmm. saw her room. Um, before that, her room was upstairs. Christy actually carried her down the stairs to come downstairs every time she wanted down. Every doctor's appointment would have to carry her up and down the stairs because she didn't like when I did it. So Christy <laughs> would do it. And it made it so much better with that room that the community built. The, our community took Karina to the next level. Um, when I talked to the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation um, and they did a story on you know all the funds that were raised and um, and things like that. I, I said, I wish I could tell you that it was all me, but it wasn't. Um, you know, our community supported um, us time and time again and really kind of adopted Karina. Um, we moved up our Christmas before she passed away. And, um, you know, it was kind of awkward having Christmas when it wasn't Christmas. Um, and especially for the reason, um, but they organized a horse parade um, that the horses actually came up to her window and she petted one by one. Um, and that evening, 200, over 200 um, community members Christmas carol to her in her window. Um, and I just thought, she said to me, um, in the morning when she woke up, I said, so what did you think of your Christmas? And she said, I don't think it could have gotten any better. And, you know, from a child who knew that that was her last Christmas, I mean, to say that, you know, I just think we could go on and on. They just right. are amazing. Um, I think it also has um, gave our community some different perspective on, you know, um, being a community, um, supporting each other, and um, Karina was very big about paying it forward and kindness. Um, so we hear stories all the time of the coffee shop, people paying for other people's coffee and, and things like that. So We have about a minute left in the program, so if there's any final thoughts that you'd like to share with the viewing audience about mitochondrial disease. I just think, um, like Karina said, every household, we want to know the name mitochondrial disease. And while Karina took mitochondrial disease beautifully, um, it is a terrible disease and um, caused her so much discomfort. And it needs uh, so much right now, a cure for sure. <laughs> I want to thank you both so much for spending time with us and for sharing your story with us. Thank you. Thank you. You've been watching A Closer Look, Mitochondrial Disease. Thank you.